Welcome back. We're examining the concept of waging peace, especially in the face of entrenched conflicts such as those in the Middle East. With me, I have Professor Johan Galtung, the founder of the Peace Research Institute of Oslo and a leading figure in conflict studies. He's here in the studio with me. Also, veteran peace negotiator and Peruvian diplomat, Alvaro de Soto, who helped to end El Salvador's 10-year civil war. Ambassador de Soto joins us from New York. Let's get back to questions. And actually, uh, Professor, I just want to pick up what you were saying about the Middle East and this idea of creating this area, this region of peace. Um, it doesn't seem anyone would even consider that kind of situation right now, though. It seems that the well, generations... Well, I had the idea first in 1971. A colleague of mine at the University of Cairo, Professor Boutros Kali, translated mm -hmm. it and got it into Arabic and Hebrew. And last year it ended on the first page of Israeli newspapers. Now, such ideas take time they take time. So let us say I, as an NGO mediator, can only work with relatively compelling ideas. And I notice that this idea has a tremendous appeal for the younger generation. Maybe it's an age question. So I have an image that within 20 years, 15 years, maybe 10 years, a young person comes up in Israel, not the gender, maybe a woman, maybe a lady, saying, I don't think the Zionist expansion as a perennial program for Israel is a starter. Maybe it never was. A Jewish state is a starter, and it never was. I go for that one. And I go for an open community without borders, with our neighboring countries. Free flow of goods and services, settlement and investment could be a little bit more problematic. That could come later. Mm -hmm. And then the regimes. And here I must say, very impressive, the work that the European Union has done in making a model that can be copied. Now, it's interesting. I want to get uh, back to Ambassador de Soto in, uh, in uh, New York and ask, considering what you said about uh, the role of the United Nations and the way it's been affected by American policy, I wonder, do you feel the international community still has a role to play in the conflict uh, in the Middle East there, or do you, will it always be subjugated to pressure from America? I think that the, the most important role has to be played by the United States. And actually, I, I held out a lot of hope uh, on the basis of what uh, President Obama said when he was a candidate and certain steps that he took uh, afterward. He clearly has an inclusive approach to the solution of international problem. He has demonstrated this uh, in holding out a hand and uh, in hoping that fists will be unclenched in exchange in the case of Iran, uh, in the case of uh, Burma or Myanmar, in the case of, uh, of Sudan, in the case of uh, Syria. Inclusivity, I think, is, is crucial. And I hope that uh, that uh, will be followed up by Senator Mitchell, who practice precisely such an approach in a very imaginative way on the conflict of Northern Ireland. Uh, part of the problem in the case of the Middle East is that the Palestinians themselves are rent apart. And it seems to me that the idea of reaching an Israeli-Palestinian agreement by ex while excluding Hamas, which at the last elections got the majority of the voting uh, public, uh, is a non-starter. The Palestinians have to come back together. And Israel has its uh, uh, own uh, internal problems. Uh, Dr. Galtung's uh, dream of a, of a prime minister who, with a totally different approach, perhaps in another uh, generation, is all very well uh, because of the fact that the Zionist project of bringing all Jews back uh, to Israel uh, has not really succeeded and they are not able to uh, carry out uh, that dream fully and also the internal political problems that are due to the uh, political system in uh, Israel where you have prime ministers who have this epiphany and realize that they have to have a, uh, a two-state solution very soon or otherwise Jew lose the democratic part of the Jewish and democratic state and yet are unable to do anything about it. 
because of a political system that won't allow it to. Right. And that's a problem that also needs to be addressed. I'm not so sure how it's going to be addressed. I, I wonder, uh, Professor, with uh, listening to that again, what uh, the ambassadors had to say, of course, Hamas, uh, an excluded party and I guess a major integral part of what would be needed in terms of talks. And also, how do you regard what uh, um, Judge Goldstone had to say and how his report was received? Well, let me first say that in my dialogues, I have, of course, had dialogues with Hamas and Hezbollah, with top people in Israel, with everybody. So for me, as an NGO person, I have the advantage that I can approach anybody I want, and they can approach me. So that is not a problem. And I found Hamas very clearly emphasizing that there is a Jewish state we can recognize. Mm -hmm. And when I asked, is that close to 4 June 1967? They said, well, there are a couple of points, and if you don't mind, we won't reveal our political agenda on that one, but uh, in that direction. I find that important find absolutely no reason why they should not be accepted as a legitimate partner. But um, <clears throat> I would like to, in a sense, uh, pick up one point here that seems to me to be important. The ambassador's approach I respect very much. It is trying to do the best under the present circumstances. It in no way excludes at the same time having an image of the future. 1995, I was invited to mediate between Peru and Ecuador. They were fighting a war which had lasted 54 years, quite a lot of time, thousands killed, an atrocious war. And the problem was how do we draw the border for the contested zone? And I said, Su Excellencia, maybe you shouldn't draw a border. Maybe she should have a binational zone, mm -hmm. maybe with a natural park. Peace park, yeah. Precisely. Okay, three years later that happened. So I projected an image on the wall. And it was rejected by the person with whom I first presented it. I'm not mentioning who it was. That's not my, in, that's within my professionalism not to do it, but very high up. And he said, very creative, but too creative. Now, for the younger generation in the presidential, it was not too creative. So it took three years. Could Jerusalem have that kind of model, for example? Yes. I think that kind of model is important. You find a cooperative project. It is impartial in the sense it's equitable between the parties. An Ecuadorian told me, I want to be hiking up in that zone. Will I meet per Peruvians? And I said, yes, you'll meet Peruvians. I don't like Peruvians. And I said, maybe you can have 500 meters each. You have from 4,000 to 4,500. He from 4,500 to 5,000. He said, but that's ridiculous. I can take it. And so it went. You see, I would be optimistic, and I have actually quite a few cases in this book. Mm. But I would like to say a warning. A success can turn into a failure, and a failure can turn into a success. The world is dynamic. Mm. Things happen. I would like to come back to Afghanistan with a concrete image. Quick thought. Is it okay? Please. Quick. I think the basic point is to recognize Taliban as member of a coalition government, having the moral fiber of the country. And the opposite is heroin and, of course, corruption. Point two, that Afghanistan will have to find its way towards the Federation. It cannot be run from Kabul. Mm. Point three, it has to relate to neighboring countries because they are in Afghanistan, Afghanistan and them, Tajiks in Tajikistan, uh, Dari speaking in Iran and so on. You know, we get a kind of Central Asian Islamic community of maybe eight parts if you can't the Pakistani part of Kashmir. Mm. Uh, point four, the basic needs-oriented policy. And last point, a security policy based on cooperation between the Security Council and the Organization of the Islamic Conference. This seems to me entirely mm. feasible and a much better road than a ridiculous, stupid war which has no chance at all and which will end in a way we know, mm. namely the Vietnam mm. way. Well, Professor, there are, unfortunately, we've got so many more questions, Myanmar, Cyprus, and so on, but I have to thank you and the ambassador for taking part, and hope we'll uh, get you both back again soon. Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you for being with us. Remember, you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us your feedback on the show and post your questions and comments. On the next show, tensions across the Taiwan Strait, are warming relations between Beijing and Taipei a threat to Taiwanese sovereignty, and would U.S. military sales to Taiwan upset the balance of power in the region? Make sure you tune in for that. From me and the team, See you next time.